Um, <clears throat> to that comment, I'm going to read you another David Tenson poem. And it says, if you must deconstruct, that's what it's called. If you must deconstruct, take every part, weigh, measure, keep, and discard necessary things. Take all the time you need, but do not camp in the ruins. Discuss discoveries, but do not raise monuments to your brilliance. Brave as you may be, instead in time build something new. Take the remains, sorrows and pains, new friends you've gained, and build something new, allowing the wise few to remind you there is a time to break down and a time to build up. The other little thing, just so you know, I'm going to read this out of Isaiah. It says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You who have been carried by me from conception and have been carried in the womb, even to your old age I will be the same, and even to your graying years I will keep carrying you. I have done it. I will bear you. I will carry you and I will deliver you. That's God speaking. And in the Latin translation of the Greek, the words that are used for womb and things like that are meo utero and meo vulva. And so you've got the father who is God, who is speaking in absolutely feminine language. It's Isaiah 46, 3 and 4. But that's just an example. And, uh, and, and, you know, a lot of this came up last night and as a historical experience, and that is that there was a, there's been a real sense that God liked men better than women, you know, and that there was this very secondary kind of thing. And, and if you read the old, old stuff from a lot of the men, it was awful. I mean, yeah. it, it was so terrible. You have... If you haven't, you have no idea the kind of blasphemy that was aimed at women. But the reality is that, that, that into the care of women was the salvation of the entire cosmos, right from the beginning, right from the beginning. And that Eve was completely and thoroughly, as, as the language says, deceived. And not by the snake, but by Adam. And so there is, a, there is this promise. And when Mary comes, it's not by the flesh of a man or the will of a man. And the Greek is an heir, which means a male. Right? So there is this, even when she turns from God, she at least turns to a relationship. When Adam turns from God, he turns to the works of his hands and the ground. And so there is, this, there is this much deeper turning that has to take place. God, God comes, incarnates as a male because that's where the greatest loss is. And if he can go down and take the men with him, he can come back. The women will be there already, right? So there is a whole different perspective that is actually ground into Scripture and, and grounded in Scripture that is not been supported by those who are the power keepers, which have been dominantly male throughout history. And so part of what you're seeing today is the continuing work of the Holy Spirit. And you see it right in Jesus' life, uh, this, this work, work to, to allow women to emerge and not get lost in the same damage that men had, right? To, to become part and central, not just part, but central and essential to the ongoing work of the salvation of the cosmos. And I've always said, you know, most men marry up, most men, which is true, and most of the relational elements of of men's lives are because of the impact of the women in their life. There is this bonding that takes place that is unbelievably mysterious between a mother and a child carried in the womb that, that we don't have access to, that we 
I think, are given a grace for, um, but it's connected to how we then relate as fathers to our children. I mean, there's all these different elements. So what are the new wineskins? I think Jason was hinting at some of them. I'm hinting at some of them. I don't know. But it's, it's like when he said yesterday when you know, one of the solutions for poverty is to put the hands in, put the money in the hands of the women. And, 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 and it's because they will respond in love, not respond in power or fear-based insecurity or, you know, addictions or anything like that. Generally speaking, they will find a way to care for their children. And that's, that's why, but that's a paradigm shift. That's a different wineskin. Right? So um, there's, there's, I was, get this, I was uh, uh, four weeks ago in Ohio with the Amish Mennonite community. They had invited me to come in and talk to them, which is wild. I mean, it's just like, so there's new wineskins going on there, obviously, right? So, um, so I'm there, and then my, I fly Delta most of the time, and my flight was through Detroit. I never fly through Detroit. And it's, it's not like the prettiest airport, and, and, um, but I just don't. I either fly through Minneapolis and, or, or through Salt Lake City or through Atlanta. And I'm like, okay, I'm flying through Detroit. That's interesting. So I get to Detroit, and it's a two-hour delay. That's Detroit. And, um, and so I'm, I'm standing in the line to get on the flight. And that's been years since I've had to fly through Detroit. So on this particular trip, I'm... I'm there, and I'm standing there, and I hear, Paul! And I look over, and there's Ben Sand, longtime friend, one of the most influential people, becoming influential people in the United States on healing the foster care system. And he's from Portland. We haven't had a chance to get together in four or five years, right? And he was in Nashville. And he walked in right before the government took the wealth up, uh, took the foster care program. The, uh, the day after the government, they took it away from whatever the uh, organization, governmental organization that was handling it. And he walked in, and within 24 hours, they had said, "We need you to do what you do in Tennessee." Right? Well, and he had only gone there because he couldn't get a hold of the guy that he needed to get a hold of. So he walked into his office and the guy turned and just burst into tears because of what had just happened. So timing, right? Timing. So here comes Ben. It was, it was this incredible thing. We hugged and stuff like that. And we got on the plane. The flight was packed except one guy didn't make the flight in the seat next to me. So I text Ben, he comes up, sits down, and we get to catch up for four and a half hours. And at one point, Ben says, so what's God's delivery system? Because he's looking at what he's involved with and, and where the world is at. And he points around to the whole flight. He said, this is God's delivery system. These human beings. It's not going to be a technique. It's not going to be the, the computer instead of the typewriter, right? It's going to be human beings. And there is what's, what I think the breath that is happening in part is that suddenly it's essential that you begin to move and work toward wholeness. And it's in tangent with that that the delivery system will make itself visible. And I think it's called a delivery system because, look, how many of, of your gatherings and stuff are predominantly women and female? You know? A lot of mine are. Yeah. And, 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 you know, what's funny, as a missionary kid, you hear the, the powers that be in the organized institutional structure of Christianity, and they're, they're arguing about the place and the role of women. And I'm from overseas. If you took the women out of leadership in the Philippines or in Indonesia, you wouldn't have a church. 
It just wouldn't exist. Yeah. And you're fighting about it inside of this cultural context, and you're substituting something as ludicrous as complementarianism. Oh, yeah, they're equal. They just have different roles. Push it. And, and so, <laughs> what? They got a different part of the Holy Spirit? I mean, come on. They're completely dwelt, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And part of what's happening is exactly what he was reading. We're having to slow down and not speed up with the technological process. I don't know if you ever read Alul much. Jacques no. Alul, my gosh. He predicted every technological transformation in, in the 20th century. And properly, he was all about Jesus. He worked in the hardest districts himself as, a, as an intellectual, but he worked there to help drug addicts and things like that. That's where he lived his life. And he was this incredible sociologist, held the seat of, of sociology at Sorbonne University and all of that. And, um, and, and he's, he's really hard on technology. He was hard on the impact of, but then he would be realistic. He'd say, okay, we brought the abortion pill, you know, horrible idea. Now, because suddenly it's not about relationship, it's about self-fulfillment in in, in serial relational kinds of situations. And so now it's not about the child. I mean, all of these things, and he pointed out that this was going to be just absolutely destructive to marriage and relationships and all this. But then he would say, well, we got it. Now what? You know. So go ahead. Something that he said there, just to, it's like, when we think about, your, that's such a great question. But it's like, there's a couple things on it. One is with the rise of AI. I was thinking about that. Yeah, the, the statement that he made on human is it's even more important. And within the context of worship, well, in short order, you're going to be able to make very efficient worship services. Yeah, 250 words. Yeah, great. Great worship songs, great sermons, and it's all going to just be made for you with the power of AI. But humanity, and I, I have this dear older friend who's South African who's brilliant, and he said, Jay, if I were you, I'd skip trying to be like anything and just go deeper into who you are. Come on. And then express that, because that is what's that is it. If the church wants a real vision of the future, becoming who we are and going deeper into that element of human creativity and what we have to offer, because that can't be that can't be made by AI, right? And 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 the machine that I talked about earlier today, we started on that with the farmer in the field and there was a time not long ago when the sun did shine and so were so the, the time before machinery, right? That machinery, when I started writing that 15 years ago, I was like, Wendell's talking about farming, but I see that in the church. We, we brought the machine and the click track and the, everything is a machine. The writing of songs is a machine. You get 16 people, which was the, the predecessor to AI. Right, you're just getting as many minds on something to make it as collectively um, pop as possible to make sure that we get the church all singing it, which is money, which is it has very little to do with how deep we go, how 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 much we're growing in our humanity, how much we. And then one last thing that I think is important is this idea of femininity, and it's got two two really important parts. So Merton, now the spire is very beautiful. So I don't want to make it a phallic symbol only because it was the heart of it was to be to get our gaze towards the heavens. But Merton brings up. So I say that before I say what Merton said, but I do think it's important to realize that I think the intention of it would have been similar intention to the gaudiness of the Catholic Church wasn't just to spend ridiculous amounts of money that probably could have spent, been spent in better ways, right? But it is a beautiful thing to see that art and to be 
to, to, to be focused upward and, you know, I, I get it. But Merton, his big thing was, we got to tear down every phallic symbol on churches around the world. We got to get rid of every steeple. Why is a phallic symbol the symbol of the church if we wanted? So he actually commissioned an artist to come and create a womb. And when he first said that, I just thought that was so beautiful because what he was saying was, that's a way better wineskin image of what the church should be than a phallic symbol. It was like the womb. What does he mean by that? Space. Gestation. Mercy. Mercy. And you probably have more. I just, I just was like, that is such a, 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 a beautiful element of, um, and then lastly, you know, I've had lots of conversations because if you remember, it was a, there was a, there was a moral failing at Hillsong and, uh, you know, and, and there was this young girl named Darlene Check who had this really great song, Shout to the Lord, but Integrity didn't know, this is got Don Moen shared this with me one time, they didn't know if the mainline Christian church in America could handle a woman worship leader. <laughs> you know, well, that's over, right? <laughs> you know, but, but I thought that's funny. To, to just bring up, uh, just that wasn't that long ago. You know, that wasn't that long ago where we weren't even sure what we were, you know, we, I came out with this because I had a lot of friends that were saying terrible things about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And, and I came out on Instagram and got myself in a lot of trouble, lost a lot of followers. Because I just said, hey, before you call her evil, may God be merciful to you on the day you stand before him. Because we were deciding whether women could even be worship leaders in 1995. And she was fighting for women's equality and rights, right? Long before we were even talking about it in the church. And that goes for almost all denominations, right? There are people like Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite preachers, that she, she was asked one time, why, did, why are you Episcopalian? Well, they were the only churches that let women preach. To get my point, it, it's like, so this is the last statement. So I was talking with a bunch of worship leaders that happened to be women, and one of them was Melissa, and we were chatting about this, and, and we said, isn't it interesting? Now, you guys do your own test, but isn't it interesting that we think we've really grown when we let women be preachers, but then the women always sound like men. All of our women preachers, they all think they have to sound like men. And I said, that's very interesting. And we, we start having this whole conversation about it. It's like, why do the women have to sound like men for us to accept them as preachers? Why couldn't a woman get up and be, and take us on a journey of mercy, take us on a journey of gestation? Why does she have to sound like this to be a great preacher? Why do all of our women preachers sound, have to sound like they're taking testosterone? And, and my point, my point is not to push up against that wineskin, but you asked the question. It's like, why, why, why do we have to, why could, we'll really, and the point of the whole conversation ended with, we'll really be on a journey when a woman can get up and preach the way a woman preaches. The way that woman preaches. Because there, there, obviously there are, there are exceptions. I understand yeah. The yeah. There, yeah. I, there are plenty of men, me included, who are more feminine on the, on the list in the way in which, for instance, I'm married and my wife and I go into a meeting on marriage and I'm always the woman and she's always the man. I'm the one that doesn't want to. We understand the distinguish. There is a distinction. I was just bringing up a point that women don't have to, you know, for a woman to be a preacher, they don't have to sound like a man. So even when we accept women preachers, we're trying to put them in a particular way to do it. That was just my thought. Yeah, and, and my point would be that it's your sound. It's your sound. 
that, it, that needs to be expressed, right? And, and the systems right now, the old wineskins, are not allowing your sound. So they will grudgingly give room if you sound like their sound. And, and that's part of what has to change. I have a friend of mine who's, who, his name's Martin Schleske, he's one of the, the best violin makers in the world. And he lives in Germany. He, he actually lives in Teresa of Avila's house in the only city in Germany that didn't get bombed during the war. And that was only because a British, um, uh, the, the guy who was ahead of the bombing fleet on the Britain side and the guy that was ahead of the German forces on the ground in that city, both disobeyed their orders. And the German put sheets on all the buildings in the city and the British who were told to bomb the city flat, the leader, the head of that whole armada didn't. He, he violated. So both of them, and you can find pictures of both of them, but that's, that's why Teresa Babel's house is still there. So he has his violin shop in there. And uh, he wrote a book called Der Klang in Germany, and it means, uh, in German, and it's, it means the sound. And in this, he talked, it's in English now, in a different form, kind of uh, called this, uh, the sound of God's unspeakable beauty. And, um, but in it, he talks about how in the old days, the violin makers would go up into the mountains and they would meet at where rivers came together. So a river coming this way, a river coming this way, and the loggers would be way up in the mountains cutting down trees, and then they'd push the logs into the rivers. The rivers would then take them down um, to where they would be pulled out and taken to sawmills and stuff. But the, the violin makers would meet at the junctions because when the logs came down and banged into each other, there were certain uh, logs, certain trees that were called the singers. And when they hit, a tone would go out. And the violin makers would go, that's a singer. And they would grab that, pay the loggers for that particular trunk. And that's the one that they would then cut up and put into their storage to dry. And that's what they made the violin bodies out of, were the singers. Um, Martin says, nowadays, he goes up with a tuning fork into the mountains, tapping on all these trees, looking for the singers because he can hit a tree and the tone will go out. He knows he's got a singer, right? And so he, um, he said, all right, so you get, first you get a singer. And he says the thing that they've now known scientifically about the singers is that they're usually in a community of trees. They're usually in a grove. And every molecular part of that tree will adapt to the environment that happens to them. So if a tree next to a singer goes down in a windstorm, the, the degree of speed that the wind now hits, the wind hitting that trunk will change the entire trunk. And the amount of sunlight that now hits it will change the entire trunk and change the tone, right? So the tree will actually twist away from light or toward light or um, away from wind if it's of a certain character. And, and then that twist is then built in. The experience of that tree is then inside the trunk of that tree, right? So, so he says, so we get the, the singers and then we dry them and then we're ready to make the violin body. And he says, he says here's, here's the deal. I could have a mathematical description of how to make a violin body. I mean, a perfect mathematical design that has all the acoustic elements, everything that modern science has put together, and I could overlay that on top of this piece of wood. But if I am not sensitive to the experiences that that piece of wood has had, I will cut across the twists and the turns and destroy the sound. And he said, here's the beautiful thing. How God works in our life, he's the master. 
But it's not about the wood submitting to the master. It's about the master submitting to the wood. Because that's redemption. That's taking all of the things in your history, all the elements that were hard, the ways that you grew up, the abuse that you experienced, the choices you made, all had an impact in your sound. And so as God works to heal you, he has to go with the grain of that experience and not cut across it. So he has to submit to everything that you have experienced so that it protects the sound. That you make. Is that not absolute? He said, This is why, this is why God is not an engineer but an artist. Right? And you know, the reason that this whole relationship happened was I was down in Florida talking to a friend of mine from Germany who who's friends with Martin, and I didn't know about that at the time, didn't know Martin. And she 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 sat there and Carol. And she says, so what are you working on right now? And I said, the four spiritual lies. Because I'd been thinking about the four spiritual lies, four spiritual laws, you know, the little pamphlet thing. And my friend Baxter calls them the four spiritual flaws. But I said, three of them are really easy to, I, to, to understand that they're just faults. Numbers two, three, and four. But number one says, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I said, I think that's absolutely rubbish. Because one, it connects God's love to this plan. We're back to the perfect will of God and all that kind of stuff. But second, it sounds like God has overlaid on our life some kind of a plan to which we then must find out and adhere to. You follow me? And what I didn't know was, and I didn't know till months later, that, that Carol was absolutely fascinated by my conversation because I said, God's not, he's not a divine planner. He's an artist. And, um, and so she takes that conversation back to another relationship. And in that relationship, one of her best friends was a young guy who was an international stuntman, right, in his mid-20s. And he had done these particular stunts hundreds of times, One, and he was now going to be on national television. No, international television doing one of his stunts in which he is catapulted over a series of oncoming vehicles. He, he, he does all these calisthenics in the air as he's flying over these cars, the last one being a truck driven by his own father, right? And so right before this stunt on international television, his friends came and said, um, look at the opportunity that God has planned for you to, to do here. You're going to be on international television. You need to be ready to give a testimony for Jesus as soon as this is over. And he started thinking about what he was supposed to say. And he got, he didn't concentrate well and he missed, he missed it on live international television and he hit the last vehicle driven by his dad and was an instant quadriplegic. And I didn't know that, but but his friends started saying to him and his mom, look at how the plan of God is that now he's going to have such a greater testimony as a quadriplegic. This is the plan of God. And when his mother heard that, she just up and walked away from Jesus. Says, if that's the kind of God you are, I want nothing to do with this. And so my conversation was with Carol was, that's not the kind of God we have. This is not, you know, so she takes it back to the mom and she, because of that conversation and Carol's relationship community being, communicating my conversation with her, the mom turns back to Jesus and says, that's not the truth, what she was told. Well, I didn't know that. For my birthday, Carol sent me de Klang, part of it translated in what I just told you and what Martin writes. There's a lot more than that Martin writes. And, and because of that, I end up meeting Martin and we became friends. So I'm speaking in the same town that Martin lives in. And he comes, he comes, he comes to the service that I'm speaking at and asks if he could play the violin. And absolutely, right? 
Well, he gets up and he introduces it and he said, I feel moved by the Holy Spirit to play Paul's story on the violin. And he begins with just this very faint melody, but then it's just like cat screeching and pain and trauma and loss. And, and I'm, just, I'm just falling apart because he with music is pulling me into my own story and my history. And the violence and the abuse and all of that, he's got it. And, he's, and then slowly and underneath this kind of sound, this little melody begins to show up and it shows up more. And then eventually it becomes part of a song that then begins to show up stronger and stronger and you hear in the background and in this in this whole presentation the redemption of a life the redemption of a life where the master has submitted to the wood and you and I were the wood and the thing about this whole journey is a movement toward releasing the sound in the cosmos that only you are. And it's not to get you to a place where the past is all gone and disappeared and somehow annihilated. It doesn't matter. It's about redeeming that history, not destroying that history, right? Or negating that history. And, uh, and I just had read at that time Wisdom House by another friend of mine who's a writer in England. And in it, he said, there was a geneticist who was speaking at a university and somebody asked him a question. Would, do you think it'll be, we'll be ever able to clone Beethoven? And he said, yes and no. He said, yeah, if you can get the DNA out of the, the bones in his casket, we could, we could clone an absolute identical twin. And we could teach that twin a fairly high, reasonable ability to play music and even to write it. But no, because Beethoven's father was an alcoholic. And Beethoven's father was a violent alcoholic. And Beethoven was the oldest and had two brothers who were younger. And as his father slipped deeper and deeper into alcoholism, Beethoven had to take over. And he had to find work in order to support his brothers. And then Beethoven lost his mom, who he absolutely loved. And it almost shipwrecked his whole life. And then he fell in love and she died. And then right as his music started to get attention, he started going deaf. And out of that, all of that experience and all of the trauma of being a human being in a broken world, none of which was orchestrated by a God who is good all the time, but a God who submits to the reality of a creation in which he has given us dominion and personal agency. And in the middle of that, as he's going deaf, out of all that loss and trauma and history and redemption, he writes the sixth powerful symphonies that we take as classic Beethoven. And the clone could never do that, right? So there is a uniqueness and your story absolutely matters. So what has this to do with new wineskins? We just told you, right? As the redemption occurs in you and you become part of a sound, your present tense ongoing relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will give you a capacity to see and hear that which will then be formed into new ways. But a heart change will, change, will then lead to mind change, then will lead to form change. You're not going to start by trying to do form change when there is no heart change or mind change. You're just going to be putting some kind of external mechanism on some kind of problem that you perceive and then trying to force everybody into it. And that's largely what we have today, right? So, so.
So you just do the next right thing in your now relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and let him inside of all of that begin to move us into new wineskins that we cannot originate ourselves. Amen? Good question. I can tell it. You're up for it? Uh, so, uh, okay, so you, I told you about the great sadness this week, yeah? And it made me think a lot about my mom. And, and my mom, she always, when she was growing up, she always wanted to be a missionary. She was the oldest of the two sisters, so three brothers, two sisters. And, uh, and the two sisters were as diverse as you can imagine. There was Bernice, Brineski, Bernice Vernona Brineski. That's my mom. And uh, then there was Ruby. Ruby was the younger. She was sort of the wild child in the family. She's like my favorite aunt in the whole world. She took me to my first movie when, you know, if God had come during the rapture, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have gone, you know. And, uh, and she snuck me to my first movie. It was The King and I with Yul Brenner. you know, such a decadent movie. And uh, you could see his whole head and everything. And um, so, uh, you know, so Ruby likes to be called Tess, and she even has an English accent, you know, so. Um, So Ruby's been, you know, my mom tried to lead Ruby to Jesus her whole life. But when my mom was 18 years old, she got accepted to Victoria Jubilee Hospital in Victoria, British Columbia. And a four-year nurses program. 18 years old, just barely out of high school, barely 18. And um, she became a student nurse to start with, right? Well, during, let's see, during the fall of that year, she she had just a few months into nurses training and was on duty one night when a couple came into the hospital and the woman was bleeding, pregnant and bleeding. Turns out that it was Reverend and Mrs. Munn M-U-N-N. And their history was that they had had five late second trimester, um, barely third, some of them barely third trimester miscarriages in a row. And this is 1948, right? There's no NICU, there's no neonatal. This is, and there's like, there's like almost nothing. There is a nursery, but the -the state-of-the-art incubators were chicken incubators, you know, with the little lights, you know. And uh, and this is 1948. The doctors were almost universally male. And they all wore white because they were the holy people. I mean, there was a real strong code. If a doctor stepped on the pathway, everybody vacated. What they say was the will of God, you know. I mean, it was a very strong culture. Um, in terms of the medical community. And um, so you were allowed to be a nurse. That's what you did. The, um, so my mom is inside that kind of world. Here comes this couple. They had decided to try one more time in their church. He pastored a big, big church in the city, in the city um, Anglican church, high Anglican. And, um, and in their community, they had decided to try one more time. And here she comes, second trimester, bleeding. The doctor, who is an elder at the church, examines her and says, I am so sorry, we have to take the baby. So he sets up an emergency C-section. And he pulls the head night nurse in, because it's at night, and one student nurse to assist and to do the cleanup. Bernice Bernona Brineski, my mom. And so she's there. To assist, the doctor delivers a one-pound baby boy, 16 ounces. He puts the baby into a kidney tray, hands him to my mom, and says, it's not viable, dispose of it. Which meant all medical waste goes into the incinerator that is just outside. And so my mom goes into the ante room, which is just outside the operating room, and she's looking at this little baby, and he's still breathing. And she's in a quandary. What do I do? And she's praying, God, what do I do? And she has this idea. So she wraps this baby into a tiny 
a piece of cloth, washcloth, puts them back in the kidney tray. And if you know anything about preemies, they normally don't make any sounds. Puts them back in the kidney tray, walks back in the operating room, and puts them up on top of the sterilization unit because it's the only warm place in the room. And her idea is, I'll just wait for the baby to die, and then I'll obey the doctor. So the doctor finishes what he needs to do, and he gets up and he leaves and goes home, leaving uh, the, head night, the night nurse, who then does a couple things she needs to do, and she leaves all the cleanup to my mom. Baby's born 10 o'clock that night, um, 1948. I don't remember the date at the moment. But, um, but my mom, she cleans up the whole place, and then she takes this little baby, puts him in her arms, sits in a rocking chair, and holds this baby waiting for him to die. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, baby's not dying. So about 1.30, somewhere about that, she says, I probably should tell somebody about this. <laughs> Meanwhile, before the doctor went home, he met with the father, and when the, when the mother came out of anesthesia, he told them the bad news. I'm sorry. You had a little baby boy, but he was not viable, and he didn't survive. So he then goes home, and so the parents are grieving, right? My mom tells the head night nurse, and she's like, my mom said she was a very crabby woman, but she's like, oh my gosh, we are in so much trouble. You are in so much trouble. She calls the doctor who comes ripping in from home and he is uh, he's just absolutely furious. Lights into this, who does she think she is? Student nurse, rips her up one side, down the other, vows that he will make sure she never graduates and says, you created this problem, you now take care of it, which meant the baby is in your hands. And she's like, what do I do? So she takes the baby up to the nursery, and, and the nurses in the nursery, they all come around this little baby boy. And over the next two days, they, they bottle, they eyedropper feed, right? And, and, but the baby loses four ounces, drops to 12 ounces. And nobody's saying anything to the parents. Right? The parents are grieving for two more days, almost three days. And on the third day, the baby starts picking up weight. And by this point, the doctor is like, I've got to say something. Right? Because the baby might live for another few days. So the doctor goes in to the parents who are grieving and says, you know, I, I have to tell you that I kind of spoke a little too soon, but, you know, we... We were absolutely sure that your little baby boy would die immediately, but due to the miracles of modern medicine, we've managed to sustain him for an extra few days so that at least you can hold your baby. So that's what the parents understood, but they are thrilled. They're thrilled. And, and the father takes that little baby and baptizes him with an eyedropper. And they named him Harold. Harold meaning good news, right? And, and you know, they prepare what they need to for the baby to pass and all that kind of stuff. Two weeks later, Mrs. Munn went home. Two months later, little tiny Harold went home to his parents in a shoebox, right? in a shoebox, and two years later, all the nurses in the nursery, including my mom, get an invitation to Harold's second birthday party. And they're invited because they were taking care of Harold, but they have no idea what really happened. And there is a code of silence, right? And so the nurses all go, and they're sitting there with their little pieces of cake trying to figure out which of these kids running around is Harold. And then finally he's like, that must be him because he's a little smaller than the other ones. But he's ripping around as a two-year-old and just absolutely looks normal. They don't say anything. And 
She goes back. She, she did graduate. That doctor did try to stop her, but she ended up graduating. And then she went to Bible school in Central Canada, became the, uh, graduated there. And when she graduated, she became the nurse there. My dad then graduated a couple years later, so there was some overlap. And my dad took a little church with another guy up in northern Canada that had a, a church of six people with two pastors. It's <laughs> fresh out of Bible school. And one day in the middle of winter, my dad said, you know, he wanted to go to the mission field as a pioneer missionary. My mom wanted to go to the mission field as a medical missionary. And he says, he says to himself, you know, it would be easier to become a missionary if I was married. And he was thinking like, I wonder how I can do that. Wait, there is a nurse down at Bible school that wants to be a missionary. And she's got a kind of a low self-image. Her sister's really beautiful and stuff, but she's not. And so she doesn't expect that anybody would ever marry her. So if I go down there and ask her to marry me, she probably will say yes. So he did that. Went down there and said, hey, I want to go to the mission field. I, before my dad died, I asked him one question. I said, dad, every time we talk, I would like to ask you one question that I don't know. I don't understand. Why did you marry mom? And he told me this whole thing, right? Love was never a part of it. It was absolutely utilitarian. This will get us to the mission field. And even if we have a, have a child, it'll even help us get there easier because it's a, it's a husband and wife and, and a family, right? So I was born ex uh, one year later, or actually nine months later, right? And when I was 10 months old, we packed up everything, moved to the highlands of New Guinea because we were going to be missionaries, right? So that's the background. Years go by. I write the shack. My mom won't talk to me about it. She actually reads it. Never knew if my dad read it. But she was having some struggles with it. And it centered around God being a, God the Father being a black woman. Right? That was the deal. But she wouldn't, she didn't talk to me about it. Um, and I didn't know, I, I didn't even know she read it at first until later. But then she heard. She was reading something and came across an obituary and it was for the doctor that had been so mad at her and he died. And she even waited a couple weeks after to make sure before she told anybody her story. That's the first time my dad even knew it. She had kept the code of silence all these years, but the doctor was dead and he is not coming back. What is he going to do? You know? So she tells my dad, and we heard about this, and she thought, you know, I wonder whatever happened to Harold. So she decides to track him down, and she found him. He was now the senior pastor of the Anglican Church just down the road from the one his father had pastored in 1948. And my mother stews for six months. Here's her issue. How do I tell Harold the truth about the way he was born without him thinking that I'm looking for credit. And she decides, okay, I'll write him a letter. And he, she writes the most benign, unintrusive, kind letter and stuff and sends it to, down to Victoria. Instantly, she gets a phone call. As soon as, soon as Harold reads it, he calls her. And he says, we need to talk. And so my conservative evangelical parents meet with Harold and his wife, high church Anglicans, which are right near the borderline of hell, you know? So, so, and my mother tells Harold the story and it blows him away. Both his parents had died and uh, he said, you know, we always knew there was a mystery about my birth, but nobody could ever tell us. And, and he's just, so he adopts my mom as his second mom. He's six foot three. He'd been to Africa on missions and established things. He'd worked for years on indigenous tribal rights in the community of faith in, in the First Nations people in Canada. He had done all this impact and every time he'd come anywhere near 
um, where my parents were living, he would stop in and spend an afternoon with my mom. And it was, it was to Harold that my mom said, you know, I have this son. And um, he wrote this book, and I'm having a problem with it. And Harold says, well, let me read it. So he reads The Shack, and he comes back. He says, Bernice, i got to tell you, I absolutely love this book. But what about God being a black woman? And he, this little baby boy, one pound that my mom saved in 1948, becomes the man who built a bridge for my mom to walk across to me. One more little piece of this. My mom goes down to try to still win Ruby, you know, Tess, back to Jesus one weekend. And on Saturday night, my mom says, so Ruby, you want to go to church tomorrow? Fully expecting her to go, no. And Ruby says, okay. And my mom doesn't hear. It's like, oh, yeah, I understand. What? <laughs> and Ruby says, yeah, I'll go. And my mom goes, oh. Where would you like to go? Ruby says, I don't know. Mama goes, hey, let's go hear Harold. Had never been inside that Anglican church, nothing, right? Let's go hear Harold. So the next morning, they get there. They take the back row. I mean, sit in the back row next to a lady. And, uh, and it's all high church stuff, you know. And, and, um, and at the end of the, oh, halfway through his homily, Harold, spots my mom and then stops and says, folks, there is a woman here. If it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't be alive. And then proceeds to tell the story, right? And introduces my mom who stands up in the back. And then he finishes the homily. Then he, then he communion is at the front after the homily. And, and people start and the woman next to my mom mistakenly says, I'm so sorry, dear, but in our congregation, you have to be a member here to participate in communion. And my mom's like, no problem. Good thing she wasn't sitting next to Tess, right? And, uh, but my mom says, no problem at all. So at the end of communion, Harold takes off his outer vestments. He walks over and he picks up the wine and he picks up the bread. And And he walks all the way to the back and kneels in front of my mom. This is my body that was broken. This is the blood that was shed. And he serves Tess and my mom communion. And suddenly, you know, the walls disappear and you no longer remember that there's all these divisions and all this order and because you've got, you've got a mother and now an adopted son, and you've got a story that links them together, and you've got this history that matters more than all, all the religious, and you know, anything like that. This, this is the real world. This is the, these are the things that are eternal in nature. And so you can see why this week has been a remembrance of my Thank you. That's the story. Thank you, Paul, for sharing that. Thank you, Ralph, for taking us on a wineskin journey. Yeah, that was good. But you know what? That was, I think, that needed to be uh, looked at. And I, I would just add one thing to the wineskin discussion that the, the new wineskin has to include these kind of conversations. It's just, it has to, in whatever form that looks like, you know, it has to allow for, for these kind of things. All right, well, that was a blessing. Um, we're going to break. We'll be back at 7 o'clock. So look forward to being with you all tonight. Jason will be leading us again. It's going to be an awesome evening. Paul? I think it's my comment. Yeah.
presence of the Spirit in him and the pleasure of eating and the drinking and him and the nights. And so what we would like, I think, in our hearts to see is new wine skins that remain cared for and continue to change as system that then we place from above down on how a church should work and function. So that denies the uniqueness of the one being involved. Mm-hmm. So it's just like you know, mm-hmm. write a good marriage book and you have to write a line for a marriage book. Like, yeah. you know, or a good child raising book has got to be a line for the child. Right? They just human beings don't fit inside constricted spaces. And that's part of as you talk about wholeness your sound is going to be part of the unity thing that you work out, and that expression will be absolutely unique and part of, of how that expression is then moving forward. And when some one person leaves that community, that community expression will change because it will have been created with every person in that community sound. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's simple little things change people. They change the culture and the things that are part of the kingdom of God that you make a decision to participate in change progress for a thousand years of people. And that was stuff horrifying and scary. And, and, and so it becomes our, all of us. This is an all of us journey. Not, oh, we've got to have leadership to figure this out and then conforms That's good. That's good. Yeah. Can we stand together? Actually, I'd love to. I'd love to pray into that. Actually, before we before we go, man, I felt something on that word. The sound, the sound in us. Holy Spirit, we just just join with me right now. Just uh, maybe put a, a hand over your heart, um, over your belly, maybe, or the place of your spirit, wherever you just want to connect with the presence of God within you. Lord, we just say yes to the unique sound and the beautiful expression of your life within us. Lord, I I thank you for this place and I thank you for many other um, churches and, and groups, families represented here. And for each one, I pray that you would give us boldness, boldness and courage to embrace this journey, to embrace the things that you're stirring here tonight through our our friends joining us. I pray you'd give us courage to release the sound and to take the time, the patience, the, the, the presence to engage, to walk this journey, to allow you to, to fine-tune us Father, we thank you that you are releasing a sound of freedom, a sound of grace. You are releasing a sound of love like never before through your people. And we are all one by your body and blood, Jesus. We are all one. So open our eyes up to that. Lord, we again, we say yes, we receive your grace to walk this out and continue to lead us from here. Bless our dinner. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. The message was recorded at the Awake Arise Advance Conference in 2023. If you would like to support our ministry, please consider a donation and be blessed.